And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to DG Will's Books in La Jolla, California. Uh, tonight, Professor Andrew Feenberg will discuss a book that he has co-edited with William Lice, The Essential Marcuse, Selected Writings of Philosopher and Social Critic Herbert Marcuse. Andrew Feenberg is Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of Technology in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. He also taught for many years in the philosophy department at San Diego State University, as well as Duke University, SUNY Buffalo, University of California at San Diego and Irvine, the Sorbonne, the University of Paris, University of Tokyo, and others. His books include Lukács, Marx, and the Sources of Critical Theory, the Critical Theory of Technology, Alternative Modernity, Questioning Technology, Heidegger and Marcuse, and When Poetry Ruled the Streets, the French May Events of 1968. He has as well edited a number of books on the philosophy of technology. The Essential Marcuse provides an overview of Herbert Marcuse's four decades of political and philosophical criticism. An incredibly influential radical philosopher of the 1960s, Herbert Marcuse was also a major contributor to the development of the Frankfurt School of Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, and Walter Benjamin. The Essential Marcuse includes key essays from the 1930s on Karl Marx, later philosophical writings on Sigmund Freud and existentialism, and political essays from the 1960s and 70s on the technocratic threat of one-dimensional society. Every essay illuminates a different aspect of Marcuse's complex thinking on the social and scholarly issues of his day while offering fascinating ways of con considering the contemporary experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Andrew Feenberg. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I'm going to keep this informal. It will not be a philosophy lecture. Uh, I'll tell you something about Marcuse's life and the development of his ideas in that context. And I think that's uh, the most interesting way to present him here tonight. He was born in Berlin in 1898. Actually, if you look at the uh, book cover, you see in the background his CV. Uh, where he uh, explains where he was born and when and uh, talks about his education. His father was a businessman. He came from a assimilated Jewish family in Berlin. And at that time, it was relatively comfortable to be Jewish in Germany. It was not a, a big issue, although I guess it was a small issue. Um, the assimilation was so complete, Marcuse once told me that in the uh, evenings on Friday, he could hear mothers in his neighborhood calling out, Brunhilde, Siegfried, Shabbat. Uh, <laughs> this may be a slight exaggeration, but I think it is true that uh, German Jews felt quite uh, secure and uh, successful at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. The, the World War I, of course, changed everything. In 1914, the uh, socialist movement split up and supported each national government in attempting to kill off its neighbors. And uh, a tremendous disaster struck. Tens of millions of people died in the war. Marcuse was a little young, but he was drafted at the end of the war and luckily did not have to go to the front. In, uh, when the war finally did end and Germany essentially collapsed, there were socialist revolutions in parts of the country, and Marcuse, uh, as a young socialist intellectual, uh, participated in uniform. He was elected to the Soldiers' Council in Berlin, which was supposed to reconstitute the army as a people's army. Uh, the same uh, sort of thing that you had in Russia a little earlier. They called them Soviets in Russia. Um, but this turned out not to be such a good experience it, the uh, Socialist Workers' uh, Soldiers' Council had as its first duty the election of officers. And instead of choosing officers that shared its ideological views, it re-elected all the old officers. All those Prussian Junkers came through with flying colors. And uh, Marcuse to uh, told me that this was really when he began to get the idea it was going to be more difficult. 
he didn't pursue his academic career immediately. He went into business with a partner. They had an antiquarian bookstore in Berlin, and he was involved in various sort of radical aesthetic uh, movements and uh, publications. But in 1927, a book was published that changed his life. This was Being in Time, the classic philosophic work of Martin Heidegger. Heidegger was a German philosopher who is often considered one of the most important, perhaps the most important 20th century philosopher. And this book is his major, his major work. Marcuse read this book and got all excited and decided to go back to college. And he went to Freiburg and registered to do his uh, uh, a second doctorate, the way that things are in Germany, you do two, or you did two anyway in those days, with Heidegger. The, um, he was appointed as an assistant to Heidegger and attended all his uh, seminars and, in fact, kept such good transcripts of the seminars that his notes are used sometimes in the publication of uh, Heidegger's early work. But he didn't exactly agree with Heidegger. There was a little gap there. Heidegger was one of the founders of 20th century existentialism. He believed that people made their own meanings, and they made the meanings of the world they were in. Meanings were not given by God or nature, but were something that people had to construct for themselves. But he also believed that most people don't engage very actively in this process, and he distinguished between merely conforming to the views of the mass uh, and making uh, an individual response, an authentic response. He called this the the difference between inauthenticity and authenticity. I think this is the idea that got Marcuse so excited. The reason is that the Marxism, which he had learned as a student and which had uh, shaped his socialist views, lacked a theory of class consciousness, a theory of revolution. The assumption was that workers would see that their interests lay in making a socialist revolution and so they would do so. But that doesn't, that's not very realistic. People don't make revolutions in order to uh, pursue an economic interest. There has to be a much larger uh, purpose in their risking their lives than uh, economic interest. And somehow the Marxists of that time had just failed to think this through. And they ended up with very reformist ideas. Workers would end up winning the elections and so on. None of this was actually working right. And the uh, uh, the, the, the cause of socialism seemed fairly, um, fairly hopeless. And what Heidegger helped Marcuse to think through was what could be the grounds for an individual deciding to make a revolution, a revolution that would be an e expression of the individuality of the individual and not simply of their um, desire for more money or more, more goods. So with this in mind, Marcuse developed his own version of Heidegger's philosophy, which was a kind of synthesis of Heidegger and Marx that was called Heidegger Marxismus. Uh, this Heidegger Marxismus is a very odd duck, um, and it disappeared in the 1930s only to return uh, in Central Europe in the 1960s when uh, other thinkers, uh, for the, I guess the best known was Karl Kosik in Czechoslovakia, tried to revive a synthesis of Heidegger and, and uh, Marxism. Well, things were moving along nicely for Marcuse as Heidegger's assistant. He wrote a, his second thesis on Hegel and uh, felt like he was making headway when, all of a sudden, Hitler won the elections. And this boded ill for his future as a Jew in the German academic scene. But it was still, I don't think he, he and his fellow Jewish students gave up immediately because it wasn't obvious what we know happened wasn't uh, predictable. Hitler was the head of a coalition government and his coalition partners may not have been all that enthusiastic about him. There was, people thought this might not last and they didn't take it as seriously as of course we do look, looking back. But soon afterwards, Heidegger, Marcuse's teacher, accepted the job of first Nazi rector of the University of Freiburg. And this was really the, the end. 
Marcuse was one of four Jewish students of Heidegger's who became quite prominent after World War II as social philosophers. The others are Hannah Arendt, uh, Hans Jonas, and um, Karl Rivet. And the four of them suddenly saw their academic career cut off, and there was really no, um, no way they could recover from this. They had to leave Germany, and they had to uh, give up on the hope of any future in the German academic world. So they scattered. Marcuse, as a Marxist, had an in with a group called the Frankfurt School, so-called because their um, institute was in Frankfurt. This was a group of academic Marxists, probably the first such group. Um, usually, you know, before the 1930s, Marxists were always people attached to a political party outside the respectable domain of academe. But these guys had managed to get inside and they had a small institute in Frankfurt and they had an endowment. And they had done some survey research before Hitler took over and it scared them. They moved the money out and they moved the institute to Switzerland. And so Marcuse, uh, as a kind of nonconformist Marxist with academic training, uh, managed to hook up with these people and he left Germany in 1933. He ended up in the United States where he spent the rest of his life. During the war, and I should mention that during this period, he was quite productive. He wrote a great many scholarly articles, mostly on the history of philosophy for the Frankfurt School Journal. And uh, he made imp significant contributions in philosophy. Then during the war, he went into an agency called the OSS, which was a sort of secret service uh, intelligence agency that uh, preceded the CIA. The CIA was uh, the post-war product of the transformation of the OSS into a Cold War um, uh, institution. And in the OSS, Marcuse and other German exiles had the task of interpreting what was happening in Germany for the US government. And he wrote quite a bit about this. Some of this work has recently been published by Douglas Kellner in English and in Germany uh, it was translated into Germany and became a bestseller in Germany. Um, it's called the Find Analyse, the, the analysis of the enemy. Um, then at the end of the war, Marcuse and his colleagues were assigned the task of denazifying Germany. One of these colleagues was Barrington Moore, and I heard Marcuse introduce Barrington Moore at UCSD when I was a student, and they agreed that they had not succeeded. Uh, <laughs> so they had not done a very good job. Um, so after the end of his service in the OSS, Marcuse went to Columbia and then later to Brandeis and finally ended up at UCSD. I think he arrived here in 1964 or 65. And um, while he moved from one institution to the other, he wrote books, important books, that made him quite well known in the, in the 50s and 60s. The first of these is uh, called Soviet Marxism, and it was a critique of the Soviet system, a very interesting critique that in a way anticipated what happened with Gorbachev, but of course it didn't ha anticipate what happened with Yeltsin. Uh, that was totally impossible to imagine in the 1950s when he wrote that book. But he, he imagined a kind of liberalization that could possibly take place in Russia. The uh, an innovation in this book was to treat Russia and the United States as both advanced industrial societies rather than to remain committed to some distinction of socialist and capitalist. He saw them both as sharing a similar structure. And uh, this becomes much more important in um, One Dimensional Man, which I'll talk about in a minute. The second important book he wrote was Eros and Civilization. This was a kind of Marxist reconstruction of Freudian uh, uh, psychoanalysis. I tried briefly to describe the central point. In psychoanalysis, Freud argued, in the psychoanalytic theory, Freud argued that human beings are born with drives. These drives uh, are oriented toward pleasure. And so they are ruled in their infancy by a, what he called the pleasure principle. This has to be checked eventually by the development of an ego, which puts the human being in touch with reality. And a reality principle then emerges uh, 
as people mature, which controls their drives. And this has both good and bad effects. The good effect is that it makes it possible for people to live in society. They couldn't if they simply pursued pleasure without any restraint. The bad effect is that it makes them guilty and neurotic, which of course is a great opportunity for psychoanalysts to apply their trade, but not necessarily good from the standpoint of the uh, individuals. So Marcuse pointed out that the reality principle is about adjusting not to an eternal and absolute reality, but to a given social and historical reality. So this reality principle through which people become what we think of as human individuals is in fact historically relative. The pleasure principle may be rooted in instincts that are eternal and um, unconditioned by history, but not the reality principle. And this reality principle is then so shaped as to um, transform the energies of the individuals into productive resources for society. And this, in particular, in, in modern societies, means adjusting to and accepting the capitalist order or other repressive orders, such as that in the Soviet Union, and laboring in the interests, in the first instance, of the system, and in the second place, uh, of whatever satisfactions are made available by the system. And those satisfactions are also historically relative. People could pursue pleasure in other ways, but they pursue it in the ways that are uh, permitted and encouraged by the system. This book contains a kind of uh, reflection on sexual liberation, which Marcuse sees as essential to uh, fulfilling life. And that became, of course, the focus of most of the journalistic commentary on Marcuse when journalists noticed his existence a few years later. The third important book is One Dimensional Man. And this was a book that came out just before I arrived in San Diego to study with Marcuse. And this book describes advanced industrial society as a kind of dystopia, like Brave New World, where people are, have bought into the system. They are completely um, propagandized and uh, not just share the opinions they're supposed to share, but also the, the, uh, um, the dispositions, the impulses, the conceptual and f even physical habits that adapt them to life in a uh, advanced industrial society. Their pleasures have become consumer goods. Their lives are devoted to alienated work. And all this in a society that is so rich and prosperous that it could offer them a much better life. And the surplus aggression produced uh, by this condition is expressed in racism and imperialism. Marcuse wrote about the, v the Vietnam War and uh, his analysis, I think, was very perspicuous and still could be applied to the events we're living today. Well, Marcuse didn't, in this book, completely despair. The last part outlines his ideas about how society could be reformed to be a better uh, society. Uh, kind of, uh, and, it, and the outline is involves transformations of technology and science, which he sees as focally involved, centrally involved in what has gone wrong. They've become involved because the technology is also historical. It's not simply the result of the latest, greatest invention. Uh, it's shaped by the demands of society into the technology of a particular era and a particular uh, set of social requirements and economic requirements. It's a source of power for the people with power and also a source of legitimacy for their regime. Because if you say progress is our most important product, then anyone who challenges the given technical and scientific disposition looks like a reactionary and uh, their voice can be silenced. So Marcuse hoped to open up the question of progress to debate. It wasn't that he wanted to go back to the woods uh, he, he thought that progress could be organized differently, that economic and uh, technical development could take a different direction that would be liberating. And so he called for this at the end of the book without much hope that it could happen since he had so successfully described the destruction of all sources of opposition in the earlier parts of the book. Well, this brings me to my own entry into the story. <clears throat> 
Around this time, I was looking for a graduate school. I didn't have a very good idea where to go because um, I wanted to study what is called continental philosophy, that's to say 20th century European philosophy, and that was not taught in very many universities in the United States at that time. There were very few graduate schools, maybe only one or two that had more than one person who knew anything about this subject. And um, so I was kind of desperate. And a friend of mine who was better informed than me told me that I should apply to UCSD because there was a new philosophy department there that was going to be uh, open to continental philosophy. And so well, I asked, you know, who, who's there? And he said, Herbert Marcuse. And I said, oh, who's that? And uh, he said, well, he's a German Marxist philosopher who writes about Freud. And he went into all the things I've just described to you. And I just shook my head in disbelief. I said, any place crazy enough to hire that guy is crazy enough for me. And, and I sent off my application right away. And I got in and went to UCSD. And there I remember the first term I took a reading course with Marcuse in Being in Time. I can't remember anything about what we discussed except that we disagreed on the interpretation. Um, so that was the beginning of my work with Marcuse and a friendship that lasted until his death. Soon after I arrived, the student movement began. Actually, it began a little bit before I arrived in Berkeley in 1964. Some of you may recall the free speech movement. Students wanted to be able to protest uh, racism and the war in Vietnam on the Berkeley campus and were told they couldn't. And so they occupied the administration building and this was really the beginning of a whole cycle of protests that uh, eventually became a worldwide movement in the late 60s and early 70s. And these student protests uh, echoed throughout the American academic world, especially, of course, in California, because we all went up to Telegraph Avenue to buy our books, and we knew people there, and they came down to infect us with their enthusiasm. And we had several graduate students who came to study with Marcuse straight from the barricades. Um, and so uh, Marcuse played a role in all this. And this is interesting. I didn't understand fully at the time. I just knew that every time he made a public speech to the students, it was incredibly moving and encouraging. And I realized that eventually he's the granddaddy of the revolution. Right? The generation of the fathers was the generation that had fought in World War II that was more or less successful after World War II and content with American life, even though many, of course, many of our parents knew that there were things that were, that there were problems and so on, but a really radical refusal of America was not available in that generation. At least we didn't know anyone like that. But Marcuse came from another world, and it was a wider world. It was a world that went all the way back to the Russian Revolution, which he must have been very aware of as a teenager in Germany and to the, 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 all the succeeding events, the German Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, the, the Nazi takeover, and so on. And Marcuse could speak to us from out of the depths of history. And that really made a difference. And so he was, of course, quite popular as a speaker because he was the guy who had criticized uh, sexual repression and science and technology and uh, all the things that had become targets of protest and uh, and critique in the New Left. Well, uh, the culmination of all this, I'll just mention two, two events that were the culmination of Marcuse's political involvements. One was at UCSD itself. His students included a young black woman named Angela Davis, and she and some other people led a struggle to create a third college on campus uh, called Lumumba Zapata College. And Yes, this was to be a third world college oriented toward the problems of um, minorities in the United States and underdeveloped countries in the rest of the world. And it ha was, was to have an overt oppositional agenda, not exactly the sort of thing you'd expect to go over big in San Diego in 1967 or 68. Um, so they, they had no luck with the administration and eventually occupied the administration building. And to do that, they had to get in the front door of the administration building, which was locked. And somebody broke the door so they could get in. And eventually, they were, of course, expelled. These things always end. And uh, 
The chancellor was very upset, he claimed, because the door had been broken. And he insisted that somebody has to pay for my door. And uh, a few days later, a money order arrived. I think it was for $55, something like that, to replace the glass in the door. And uh, there's an interview with the chancellor where he says, I knew that was Herbert who sent me that money. <laughs> so I think Marcuse was thinking, well, it's the people's property after all. You know, sometimes you have to break the door, and, but then you have to fix it. So um, eventually they did get a third college. It was named after a, a, a black hero, but not uh, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, it was named after Thurgood Marshall, and it still uh, exists. The second story about Marcuse and the student movement has to do with the May events in France. I was studying in France in 1967 and 68, and in, in May of 68, there was a conference on Marx at UNESCO. And Marcuse, along with scholars from many other countries, arrived to participate. And this just so happened to coincide with a student revolt that was starting up in Paris at the time. No one really knew what was going to happen in the early uh, days of May, but it eventually grew to be the largest student movement in the history of the uh, Western world. Hundreds of thousands of students participated, and eventually 10 million workers went on strike, closed down the whole country, um, and uh, France was in chaos for a month, and they practically overthrew the government. So Marcuse was there at the beginning, and uh, just before he arrived, a newspaper had published an article called the, the, the uh, title, Marcuse, Guru des étudiants en révolte. Marcuse, the guru of the students in revolt. So Marcuse was suddenly far more famous than he'd ever been before. Um, and he wasn't used to it. When we uh, arrived at UNESCO together uh, that first day, journalists were clustering around him with TV cameras and uh, tape, tape recorders, and they all wanted interviews, and he looked really nervous. He was not happy with this at all. And one young journalist came up to me and he said, the professor looks really unhappy. Maybe I can take him somewhere. I promise not to ask him any questions. I have a car. Turned out it was a, a fellow who later on became the leading right-wing uh, news anchor in France, uh, Jean-Pierre Elkavache. But at the moment, he was a young guy, and this looked like a fun thing to do, and we did it. I asked Marcuse, do you want to get out of here? He said, yes, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we got in the car, and El Kabash said, where do you want to go? And he said, I want to meet the North Vietnamese delegation. And remember, the Paris peace talks had just begun in Paris, and so we drove to the Lutetia Hotel, and they sent down someone to talk <laughs> to Marcuse. And a little, a little guy came down, straight out of the jungle, I'm sure, uh, and he uh, opened the conversation by complimenting Marcuse on his great age, which didn't go over big. <laughs> but they had an interesting discussion, and uh, Marcuse told him, that the one thing I remember clearly from the discussion was Marcuse saying, don't count on the American working class to end this war. Uh, he, was already, he had already been convinced from er, far earlier, it's certainly clear in One Dimensional Man, that the working class was no longer the agent of revolution you could count on in the Western, the wealthy Western countries. So I don't think the Vietnamese needed this advice. Um, they did pretty well uh, without it, but, but it certainly it was an interesting connection. Then we went, Ed Kabash took us back to Marcuse's hotel, and as we were about to enter the hotel, which was across the street from the art school, some of the art students came up to him and said, are you Professor Marcuse? Of course, his picture had been in the newspaper as the guru, right? So everybody recognized him on the street. And uh, so he said yes, and they said, would you, we've just taken over the art school, would you care to address the General Assembly? <laughs> so this he liked. I mean, unlike the journalists, this he thought was interesting. So we went in, and he gave a little speech, uh, bringing the greetings of the American student movement, and congratulating the students on their struggle against consumer society. He was not aware that many of these art students were Maoists who were hoping to build a worker-peasant alliance to uh, establish the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat in France. 
And uh, they looked at each other in surprise because they were not really on the, attuned to this concept of consumer society. Um, but I think they were pleased to hear from an international celebrity like Marcuse who supported their cause. So he left a few days later just before all the airports were closed down and all transportation in and out of France became uh, impossible. Well, this, these events in France and in the United States in, inspired Marcuse to write his most optimistic book, probably his only optimistic book. It's called An Essay on Liberation. And in this book, he projected a revolution, not, not a revolution of students, which who of course don't have that power, but of uh, a kind of utopian vision of a revolution in advanced industrial societies on the basis of the, the general realization by the populations that the structure of the system is absurd. The wealth is so great, the opportunities for fulfilling life so, so enormous that to maintain the system in the straitjacket of traditional capitalism, the constant struggle for survival with huge differences in wealth and uh, condition so simply made no more sense. And this absurdity had become available to students and other marginal groups, not just at the level of opinion. It wasn't just that they said this is absurd, but at the level, at the somatic level, at the level of their feelings and uh, impulses and dispositions. So they could no longer stand uh, to engage in the rat race and to live the way they were supposed to live in the society. And this led then to a, uh, a conception of, a new conception of revolution that I think in many ways goes back to that original theme of authenticity that he picked up from Heidegger. It's a solution to the problem of class consciousness that Marxism has never really been able to solve adequately. Um, well, I'm going to end soon. Um, after this, there are a number of political events that occur that led to uh, Marcuse being fired from UCSD. For, for one thing, he had a student, Angela Davis, who was a very radical uh, black student, who she, at one point joined the Communist Party and became quite prominent in radical circles. She visited a Black Panther in prison, and when he broke out later, she was charged with supplying him with a gun. She was on the 10 most wanted list and hunted for months by the FBI and eventually caught. And during this time, Marcuse defended her. And this made him more prominent than ever, but not in a way that garnered him a lot of favor from the uh, government of the state of California. Um, eventually, Angela was acquitted. So the charges against her were, were not supported by evidence, and Marcuse had been right to keep faith with her and believe in her innocence all along and defend her. But that, of course, did not rebound to his credit in the minds of people who regretted her acquittal for one reason or another. Um, so he made a lot of powerful enemies in that period. And then he made a, a speech on a panel in New York at a conference that, uh, for some reason, got picked up by the newspapers. And it was no different from many other speeches he'd made, but it came to the attention of the San Diego Union. Editorials were written about this dangerous communist who was poisoning the minds of the students, the American Legion hung Marcuse in effigy in front of the city hall and offered to buy out his contract. The um, chancellor rejected this as an absurd uh, uh, offer. Um, he said, you don't buy out the contract of a professor like a football player. Uh, so, and of course he was right. That wasn't the way you get, that's not the way you get rid of university professors. Um, Within, he defended Marcuse for a year, but in the, the second year, uh, a way was found to gracefully separate Marcuse from the institution. And he uh, ceased to be a professor at UCSD. Fortunately, the arrangements under which he was eased out permitted him to finish with the, his current students, of whom I was one. So I was able to get my PhD writing a dissertation for Marcuse, even though he was forbidden from teaching on the campus. Of course, this didn't shut him up. He traveled all over the world. He was quite famous, probably 
one of the maybe one of the two most famous philosophers, three most famous philosophers in the world in the 70s. And he traveled around the world giving lectures and he was, he was uh, an important uh, figure in the intellectual world. But he was no longer a teacher in the university. In his last years, Marcuse became more pessimistic. The movement died out. Marcuse wrote a book in which he talked about what he called the preventive counter-revolution, say the mobilization of the right um, in Western societies to suppress the new left and uh, to reorganize the society around even more intense competition and struggle um, through recession, through reactionary uh, policies of all kinds. And of course, we live in the era of preventive counter-revolution Marcuse announced in the late 70s. And soon after that, he published his last book called The Aesthetic Dimension, um, which really represents a retreat into art as the last domain of imaginative freedom. Um, I don't think he ever gave up the hope that the imagination could someday reorganize the social world, but for the moment it was effective only in the aesthetic domain. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take questions or comments from the audience. What happened to Heidegger after the war? Well, you know, they kicked him out as rector of the university within a few months. Um, he had a fantasy. I mean, the guy was not really living on this planet. He had this fantasy of what National Socialism was that just didn't have anything to do with the real thing. And the Minister of Education is said to have remarked that Heidegger's National Socialism was purely personal. Uh, so they, they, he had to resign, I think, after seven or eight months, um, not having actually achieved anything. Uh, except to discredit himself. And then he remained, uh, I think he remained enthusiastic about the idea of a national socialist revolution, even though he saw increasingly that it wasn't being realized in the form he had hoped by the national socialists. And after World War II, he was uh, one of the people who got denazified. Um, Marcuse went to see him actually after World War II there's an interesting exchange of letters. Marcuse wrote him a letter saying, I've been sending you care packages and my friends are saying, why are you sending care packages to the Nazi Heidegger? Can you please explain yourself? Heidegger wrote back, well, what happened in, with the Nazis, he says, was we had a choice between Bolshevism and Nazism and Nazism was the better choice. And anyway, what the Allies have done to the Ostdeutschen is similar to what the Germans did. And Marcuse was outraged. He wrote him back and said, you betrayed philosophy by this uh, uh, terrible way of thinking about these historical events. And then he, w he later went to see him, and uh, th I think they had a stormy session. And that was the end for Marcuse. And Heidegger was denazified. He was forbidden to teach. He had a kind of nervous breakdown and spent several months in a hospital where he tried to translate the Tao Te Ching with the help of a Chinese student. Uh, he, that was probably what cured him. I mean, you know. <laughs> He, he gave up, though. There's no Heidegger translation. So then he came out and gradually got rehabilitated. He tended to minimize, obviously, his association with the Nazis after World War II. And he became famous as a critic of technology. And this was something that interested Marcuse and I think still had some influence on his thinking. But um, he did something really shocking. He gave an interview which he with Der Spiegel, which he said could only be published after his death. And in this interview, he says that the National Socialists had the right idea, they were just too limited as people. And so you realize, I mean, the guy, he, there's something really wrong. He could not learn anything from, uh, from history. It's astonishing. A real moral and uh, social blind spot. Still, he was an important philosopher, and I think it's wrong to claim that his philosophy is Nazi ideology. I don't think that's correct. Question from that lady. Yeah, uh, three quick questions. I don't know if your answers will be quick, too. Compare him to Hannah Arendt in terms of Jewish identity and relationships with Heidegger. That's one A and one B. Um, Sartre as a Heideggerian and a Marxist. And then the breakup of SDS uh, in 1969, how he saw that. Well, Hannah Arendt and Marcuse were, of course, students at the same time. Um, 
but she was much more loyal to Heidegger's thinking than Marcuse. And the break which Heidegger, which Marcuse made in 1933, uh, he, she never made. So there's no document of hers like Marcuse's very violently critical essay. I think he came out in like 1934 in which he attacks Heidegger's uh, existentialism. Um, and I don't think there was any love lost between them. I think Hannah Arendt and uh, the Frankfurt School hated each other. Like, you know, but that's par for the course with German intellectual exiles in the U.S., so <laughs> nothing unusual about that. Um, so the first question about the relation of Marcuse and Hannah Arendt, I think, is easily answered. The second one? Sartre's combination of Marcuse and Heidegger. Well, uh, Marcuse wrote a very important and interesting critique of Sartre's uh, being a nothingness in the 1940s. It's a wonderful essay. It's included in the book, in case you want to read it. It's right there. <laughs> um, and at that time, he observed that in Sartre's being a nothingness, uh, as with other existentialist works, human beings were interpreted in ontological, human life is interpreted in ontological terms, that is to say, in terms that were um, timeless. And so no real account of history was possible from the standpoint of uh, this existentialist work. And this, of course, he would have argued was also true of Heidegger's uh, being in time. But then later on, Mar Marcuse appreciated Heidegger's political radicalism. Sorry. You know, Sartre, I'm sorry, Sartre's political radicalism. You know that Sartre wrote a preface to Fanon's Wretched of the Earth and uh, came out uh, for the Algerian Revolution and um, refused the Nobel Prize, and he did a number of things that Marcuse admired, and so his later comments on Sartre are very positive. And then your third question. The breakup of SDS in the Yeah. Uh, SDS was the major student organization in the U.S. in the New Left, and it split between those who thought the working class was going to make the revolution in the U.S. and those who thought other social forces would have to make the revolution because the working class was no longer revolutionary. And obviously, the, the Marcuse's side in that dispute was clear, and he was invoked by the, the opponents of the uh, working class wing of the movement uh, as a sanction for their views. So he, he played a small intellectual role in the events of the new, new left, including that one. You know, there's, a, there's an interview with him where he's asked later on what he thinks about the student movement, and he says, the interviewer says, have they gone beyond you, Professor Marcuse? And he says, they have gone beneath me, they have gone above me, and they have gone beyond me. <laughs> so, and he explains that it's a kind of coincidence that his thinking should converge with theirs at a certain moment in history and not, he shouldn't be thought of really as a, as a political figure. Of course, that hasn't prevented people from thinking of him as a political figure and forgetting him as a political figure too. Well, the questions are about Marcuse's relation to Gramsci. Gramsci was a theoretician of, a, Lenin, a kind of Leninist theoretician of the communist revolution, a communist movement in Italy. And so there wasn't really a, much connection. Um, now, in recent years, French uh, intellectuals have transformed Gramsci. So, so he's completely unrecognizable. And he's become a thinker whose ideas are disconnected from the movement of the proletariat and have a, a, uh, a sort of postmodern veneer. Uh, and it would never have occurred to Marcuse to transform Gramsci in this way. If he had an idea, he could express it without doing that. Um, but so I don't, I don't see any, any real connection. Um, I don't see how that connection could be made without distorting Gramsci's thought drastically. Yes, these are good questions. Um, Marcuse did not have a strategy for defending the academic freedom of radicals in the university. Um, he wasn't a strategic thinker. That wasn't the level at which he operated. Um, in fact, I mean, he was in, he believed the university enjoyed a certain independence of other institutions in the society and that that should be defended. 
the university should not be integrated to society, but on the contrary, main, should maintain its autonomy and uh, provide a cover under which ideas, even unpopular ideas, could be discussed. So he was, a, in a sense, you could say his ideas about the defense of radical faculty were the conventional ideas about academic freedom that most faculty entertained, um, except with the possible exception of those doing military research who were inconvenienced by the views of people like Marcuse. As for the second question, the, uh, there are fashions in the academic world, and Marcuse was at one time very fashionable, and that enabled him to sell hundreds of thousands of copies of books that most of the purchasers couldn't understand. But uh, um, they probably got some inspiration from at least you know, reading a few pages and holding it in their hands. Uh, and then, of course, it also meant that the, th the, the, the lesser number, the thousands or tens of thousands who could understand it, knew it was important and got a hold of the books. Today, the fashion has shifted, and Marcuse is not fashionable anymore. So it's much harder for people to find their way to his books, people who would be interested if they, if they knew about him. Um, I think that much of what is currently fashionable is not politically, on the left in the academic world, is not very useful politically and not very inspiring. It's very complicated, it's overly rhetorical, overly jargonized, and just not much in touch with anything actually happening that anyone's actually feeling except, you know, very small uh, minorities of people engaged in certain kinds of, I don't know, um, of academic dissent from their discipline. So I'm sort of disappointed in the direction fashion has taken in the academic world, but there are still a few people who will assign Marcuse in a class. And uh, there's, at UCLA, there's Douglas Kellner, who's written a lot about Marcuse, and um, if you have a chance, you can take a class with him. Uh, in classes on the Frankfurt School, sometimes some texts of Marcuse's are assigned. I found when I assign one-dimensional man, and I, I ask the students, does this seem up to date to you? And they say, oh yes, the, the only thing that seems out of date to them is this place called the Soviet Union. <laughs> um, but otherwise, it really rings true uh, to experience today. Um, so we haven't really made much progress since the 60s, except maybe there are more people who feel that way now than there were then. Um, as for my own work, I focused primarily on the problems of technology, and I've extended and uh, in some ways modified that aspect of Marcuse's work. He was the one member of the Frankfurt School who actually wrote something important, significant, about technology. So as he has gone out of fashion and other Frankfurt School people have come into fashion, the theme of technology has dropped out of discussion of, uh, of the Frankfurt School. And that's regrettable because that was really an important contribution and probably more relevant than many of the things that, uh, that are currently uh, much discussed. So I'm trying to sustain that aspect of the Frankfurt School's heritage. Yes? Yeah, in about 1975, uh, the chair of the philosophy department, Fred Olison, interviewed Marcuse right. about his relationship to Heidegger. And it, um, I don't know if, the, if this text, if there was you know, a video that, that people would see. And in that, um, Mark. Olofsson was attempting to uh, sort of uh, get Marcuse to stress and emphasize uh, the influence of Heidegger on him and continuities in their thought. And Marcuse characterized Heidegger in, in the following terms. He said that Heidegger's categories for understanding human beings and human being itself were fascist and totalitarian categories, that it wasn't, the problem wasn't a matter of Heidegger's relationships, you know, to the Nazis uh, in particular. The problem was that his, um, his the basic structure of his thought um, was uh, authoritarian and proto-fascist itself. So, uh, 
I wonder if you have any thoughts about that way that Marcuse came to think about Heidegger. The interview is in here. Yeah. Good. So we can actually find the, the passage. Um, I think what he was, the interview is not really all that accurate. I mean, his memory was not all that accurate. He said that in the beginning he had few reservations about Heidegger. But in fact, he wrote things in his Heidegger Marxismus phase which were quite critical. There's a passage, for example, in which he says, uh, um, does Dasein, the, German, the word for human being in Heidegger, have the same relation to the world, whether he is, he says, Dasein does not have the same relation to the world uh, if, if he is a peasant rather than a bourgeois, a shopkeeper rather than a, uh, a f government functionary. And he says, in other words, the relation to the world, this fundamental ontological relation, is socially relative. And he says, this is an insight that Heidegger does not even approach. So this is like in 1929 when he's Heidegger's assistant. He's very critical. And here, he's too critical. Um, it, let's see. I can't uh, quickly find where he said, but basically what he says was the categories under which Heidegger analyzes human being are the negative ones, anxiety, boredom, uh, death, where there's no place for joy. Um, you know, here he says, he says, if you look at this, his view of human existence, you will find a highly repressive, highly oppressive interpretation. I've today gone again through the table of contents of being and time and have a look at the main categories. I can just read them to you. Idle talk, curiosity, ambiguity, falling and being thrown into, concern, being toward death, anxiety, dread, boredom, and so on. Now this gives a picture which plays well on the fears and frustrations of men and women in a repressive society, a joyless existence overshadowed by death and anxiety. Um, so he doesn't, he says, uh, he says, I see now in this philosophy ex post a very powerful devaluation of life, a derogation of joy, of sensuousness, fulfillment. And we may have had the feeling of it at that time, but it became clear only after Heidegger's association to Nazism became known. So it's not quite <coughs> as, as brutal a condemnation as you recall it, but it's pretty brutal. Um, still, I think that... What he's, he's not saying that this, the, the doctrine is systematically Nazi. It's the tone, the, the moral atmosphere of the doctrine, which brings it into relation to uh, uh, a repressive um, social organization. Um, I, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced by Marcuse's critique. There were many other, because I mean, there's a risk of confusion there. There were many ways of being a, a right-wing conservative in Germany. You didn't have to be a Nazi and want to kill all the Jews. That has become the, the, the emblem, right, of, con, of German conservatism. But uh, there were monarchists. There were people like Ernst Junger who were uh, very unenthusiastic about Nazism and had to be kind of dragged into it. Um, so... I think Heidegger could have made other choices that would have been easier to defend after the war, but then he couldn't have become Nazi rector of the University of Freiburg, right? So, you know, something in him made him ambitious and uh, he wanted to play a role in history and that misled him. So there's also a passage in there where he says that there's something about Heidegger's technology critique which he finds interesting. That's his post-war critique of technology. But I think he underestimated the influence of Heidegger on his thinking. The question is whether, since Marcuse from his time with Heidegger was concerned with life being joyful and authentic and, authentic and sensuous, did he envisage that as a possibility outside the framework of a revolution that would transform society as a whole? In other words, as a private pursuit? 
Yeah, or yeah, or was his? Did he need to give the the meaning of revolution a, a sort of different definition? That becomes the project. What is what is the definition of a revolution that would allow people to be authentic and joyful and sensuous? Is, am, is, well, so now the question is slowly shifting. Did this mean that the idea of revolution had to change? Of course, the possibilities of private happiness in a repressive society are not zero, but they're much curtailed by the conditions under which people live. And this is especially true, of course, for people who have very little uh, money and uh, have dangerous and boring and uh, poorly paid jobs the great majority. So um, there's a question of solidarity, right, that's raised by this. Of course, one could, if one was rich, enjoy life, but does that mean one is uh, without any obligation to the millions of others who uh, don't enjoy it, can't enjoy it, or whose enjoyment is diminished by their condition? Marcuse, the last line of One Dimensional Man is a quote from Walter Benjamin, only for those without hope is hope given to us. And this is an expression of solidarity across, a fraternal solidarity across class lines. So I think, of course, the idea of revolution that is often identified with the Soviet revolution, the Russian revolution, is everyone becomes a worker in a grim, gray factory existence. And that's exactly the opposite of what Marcuse was in favor of. And one of the things he liked about the new left and the counterculture was the fact that people were openly in favor of pleasure and pursued it. Uh, the ascetic, self-sacrificing mode of socialist heroism did not appeal to him, it's certainly not in a society like American society that is so rich in which uh, so many possibilities for pleasure were available. Um, I once gave an interview on Marcuse to KPBS and the call-ins included somebody who said, you know, he says, that Marcuse guy was a real hypocrite. He says, I used to see him down at the beach with his wife in La Jolla. <laughs> so like, a socialist is supposed to be someone who's miserable, you know, and wears, <laughs> wears blues and uh, uh, is poor and eats beans. And, but you know, that's just not his thing. I mean, he was, <laughs> uh, so, so I guess... It's a different kind of revolution, yes, because it's a revolution in, in an affluent society, not in a poor society. And the problem isn't to spread around the scarce resources so that no one is hungry. It's to make a generous use of those resources so that everyone can enjoy life. Does anyone play the role Marcuse played in his era for our era today? The short answer is no. <laughs> and I'm, I very much regret that. <laughs> uh, Professor okay. Andrew Feinberg. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>